In a wooden boat in the shipping lane, with the freighters towering over me, I can see the jets flying overhead, making lines across the darkening sky. And when the sun is going down, I can take a taxi into town, or the raider at the restaurant sets a table just for one. Wheels keep on spinning round, spinning round, spinning round. Wheels keep on spinning round, spinning round and round. So I hired a plane to take me to a place so far away from you. Eventually we began to see that we could be completely free. And I could get away from you. And you could get away from me. And we could live each separately in our cities in the sun. Wheels keep on spinning round, spinning round, spinning round. Wheels keep on spinning round, spinning round and round. In a seedy karaoke bar on the banks of the mighty Bosphorus, there's a Japanese man in a business suit singing Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. And the muscular cyborg German dude stands with sexy French Canadians while the overweight Americans wear their patriotic jumpsuits. Oh, you say you are not in love with me. Oh, you say you are not in love with me. Oh, you say you are not in love with me. All right. How's everybody doing? Oh, thank you. If anyone is enjoying the the podcast with Chris, I I've been a little worried about it. Uh, it's it's always hard to know how to how to grasp the needle. Uh, but it's a work in progress. I think, I think it comes, I think we have at least a, what I've wanted to do with it is try to take some of the stuff we've been talking about in here, some of the ideas and concepts and put them into a, uh, it's like a container, a historical container. Ah. But the thing that's really, you know, always dogs me is what do you pick? What do you talk about? You know, and then that's, what do you leave out? That's what's always, uh, so what I've always tough. So that's why I've tried to focus on just like my role is within it. Just trying to sketch together a, uh, a meta narrative, which is what you don't get when you learn about uh, history in, 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 uh, school is, is a meta narrative of why these things are happening. You just get them happening. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully people like it. And if you don't, I understand. So, oh, uh, I don't have a copy yet because uh, it's not available uh, as an ebook. At least, well, I could probably have asked for it, and somebody would have sent it to me. Never mind. I'm gonna get a. I'm gonna get a copy of Black Jacobins for next week. So uh, we will be doing Black Jacobins next. I haven't said uh, how much of it. Uh, I'll say that on a future show. But sometime next week, hopefully, we're gonna start reading the Black. Jacobins by C.L.R. James, classic piece of Marxist history, uh, and I think something that will be useful to talk about in the context uh, that we've been discussing all of these books, which is, you know, or at least the historical ones, uh, and that is, you know, the making of the Atlantic world, 
uh, and the Atlantic uh, Empire that we're now like in the terminal phase of, uh, and the key turning points and the key phenomenon that made it happen, and uh, like the extension of uh, the creation of a slave economy outside of the metropole of Europe broadly, but like the Atlantic, you know, the, the, the British, uh, and then later Anglo American, uh, economic unit, uh, and how that was able to, uh, accelerate capitalism accelerate the uh, social coercion, co cohesion of capitalism into a absolutely hegemonic force in Europe because there is a lot of resistance. There's a lot of resistance to capitalism. First and most importantly, uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, from the uh, top of the social orders that were being uprooted by it, the old feudal land-based ruling class that sees itself losing its authority over the course of those centuries and fights back. I think that the, uh, the English Civil War is like the first big uh, uh, explosion of that conflict. Well, the Eighty Years' War first, but then that, as part of the 16th century, 17th century sort of convulsions, that ended, I would say, with the conditions that uh, allowed capitalism to triumph. Uh, and like cemented its control. That would be the glorious revol the glorious revolution of 1688. More than anything, but we've talked about that in the past. So, so that was the first sort of emergence of elite resistance to capitalism. But then the 19th century is defined by uh, by common. If we're going to still talk about like these feudal orders that are being broken up, these feudal social arrangements that are being broken up by capitalism. It's like a wedge breaking up this thing. It's like a jackhammer breaking up this thing, but the chunks are still there, and they make up the new uh, world. So you're not just, when I say common, you can't just say working class because that's being brought into existence by the emergence of capitalism. Before that, you had a common group, which included merchants, but included peasants. Uh, it included everybody who was not of the uh, the landed authority, and they were being sorted into pr positions within this new proletariat in the 19th century, and they revolted. Uh, somebody says, "Do 30 Years' War." That is a project that me and Chris want to do. If we do another show, we would like to do the 30 Years' War. Because I do think that if you talk about the 30 Years' War with uh, um, detours to talk about the Eighty Years' War and the English Civil War. If you do that, you have essentially narrated the the birth of capitalism as the dominant, uh, not just European's uh, um, mode of production, but the world empire. But what? So you see this huge explosion of violence as capitalism is coming into being from all ends. That that of course racks the 17th century, but continues on into the 19th. And at every point, what is sta what stabilized it, and allowed it to, uh, and allowed the conflict to not become fully apocalyptic, to allow structures to continue to be developed, state capacity and such, was the existence of this. This place where the most horrifying uh, resource exploitation, uh, both in the terms that resources needed in a place that didn't have a lot of them, but also um, the intense bodily exploitation that needed to uh, carry off, that needed to happen to, con to allow this to persist, to allow this system to exist, like uh, the the the, the Groaning gears of European capitalism were literally oiled with the blood of the uh, of the of the colonies. Like you look at sugar, for example, sugar not something that is native to Europe, 
not something that constituted any element of the European diet for the vast, vast length of the existence of that of people in that area. But as capitalism and its massively painful birthing uh, miseries are, are occurring across the continent, what should exist but this new thing, this thing that you can eat and that tastes good? But the thing about sugar is, is that at this time, and honestly still now, but back, of course, way, much more back then given its technological uh, level, to make sugar is to do, un, is to, uh, do un, unfathomable pain to the human bodies because it is incredibly labor intensive. It requires a lot of really shitty work that nobody wants or would want to do that would not be anything that anyone would choose of their own volition to do. If you have uh, a relatively uh, contained social order like post-Westphalian Europe and these contained nation states, you can't do that kind of uh, exploitation uh, in order to facilitate like the soothing of the uh, of the anxieties of the of the now newly precarious upper classes you can't do that without creating a uh, unsustainable social uh, dislocation alienation and resentment at the bottom unless that work is being done elsewhere by people who don't count and that's what the colonies allowed for And so now you have this thing, sugar, that is incredibly profitable. It has an entire industry around it and forms, for example, fr a majority of France's uh, uh, trade is this literal luxury that is only possible through massive hyper-exploitation. And, of course, to a lesser extent, that's true of all of the, uh, of the new consumer uh, comforts that are enjoyed thanks to uh, the transatlantic trade. And it's that, uh, it's that introduction into the equation of European capitalist creation that sustains it, that rescues it at every point, that allows for the transition from a system within Europe that is leading to the common ruin of the contended classes in two world wars that were genuinely... Uh, you know, if Europe was the world, our, our would, would have been the vision people had of total apocalypse. But they were rescued from that by the uh, the creation of a set of settler states on that land that are able to create their own capitalist uh, social orders and political economies that could then become the world sovereign. The world sovereign that Europe was always seeking and could never get, from fucking uh, Charlemagne to Charles V to um, to Napoleon to Hitler, everybody failed because Europe it can't be done in Europe. But globally, once you have a sufficient degree of technological advancement in order to allow power to be remotely enforced. Now you have a power that can truly uh, uh, attain universal the universal monarchy. But of course, the sovereign is not an emissary of God, as he was understood, but an emissary of the devil, of Satan of uh, Old Scratch himself, the capitalist algorithm of profit extraction, which untethered to any uh, resistance feedback loop, uh, unable to be 
pulled away from its maximal position by the application of human uh, coordinated action will destroy the earth, will make the earth hell, will reign in hell, just like you wanted to do in Paradise Lost. <coughs> like they, like, capitalism is, was a tool created by man to win his petty war of power, and in so creating it, has lost sovereignty over the earth to it because no longer does uh, the fate of the earth hinge on human decisions. Yeah, the great Satan. They were right about that. They nailed it. Of course, now everybody's part of the thing. The, the world system has locked into, into uh, gear. And now, no matter what the discrete ideology of the people at the top of any social formation in the world might think of themselves, they actually serve the algorithm. Everybody serves the algorithm, no matter what they think they're doing. They're, 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 they think that they're... Def they're uh, defending Allah's honor against the West or whatever the fuck, or they think they're they're uh, preserve they're preventing China from descending into another century of humiliation, or uh, they're defending social democracy, or or the white race or whatever the fuck they think they're doing. What they're actually doing is serving the algorithm, because all of their decisions at the end of the day have to conform to the algorithm's dictates. Then they can make up a reason why they're doing it. After that. They can have their best minds sit around and figure out how what they're doing is actually for the greater good of Allah or uh, the, the Han people or um, or the America, whatever the fuck that means, or even the best the self interest of the person, which is of course being undermined because our goddamn ability to live on this planet is being undermined. I mean, my God, look at the space race stuff. Somebody's pointed out very astutely that the space race stuff with the billionaires isn't so much about them escaping to Elysium. Some of them might be might think that's possible, but they're but that they would be the dumber ones. I would say that uh, most of those guys uh, and gals at the top uh, are aware enough of you know the actual state of technology to understand the 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 non viability of of uh, of outer space is a long term. Uh, per, as a long-term uh, destination for themselves and their families. They know that. That's why I think most of them believe that they're going to go into the fucking singularity, because even though that's just as much moonshine, it's something that uh, is easier to trick yourself into believing is real. I think if you have a curse, like if you fucking read a collection of Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, articles, you know that it's incredibly expensive and difficult to live in space, and that do and that terraforming Mars is a fantasy, and all this stuff isn't real. The reason that they do this stuff, for the most part, other than the fact that hey, maybe it works, and hey, maybe I get to go to space, that'll be fun, like as a recreation, is that they have accumulated more money than they could possibly put back into a system where rates of uh, profit are declining, and there is no profitable investment to be made in the markets. What they could do is accede to those profits that are useless to them as investment vehicles and useless to them for personal consumption because they could never spend that much money on themselves. They are useless to them. That money is, in a literal sense, useless to them. In the, it, they cannot invest it in the long term, and they cannot use it personally. They just have it. This is why, cyclically and traditionally, societies have to uh, destroy accumulated surplus otherwise it fatally destabilizes a social uh system and the thing that makes the the the, the that jubilee happen is not the fucking algorithm it is people it is the people who man the machines recognizing what's happening and what we are is a place where there's nowhere else nobody is connected enough to the machines to be able to interdict 
because of our intensification of technology, of the fact that technology has its own logic that we become subservient to. Shout out to my friend uh, 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 John Collins for reminding me of this central fact, that we are living in a technological society in which human interaction has become uh, superfluous. And most importantly, human intention is superfluous. And in fact, beyond the point. Because the thing is going to do what we're going to do what the thing tells us to do. And then we're going to make up in our culture and in our halls of state reasons that it was actually in uh, some broad understanding of our interest. But anyway, so these rich guys are doing that too because they have this money that they cannot spend and they cannot invest. It could be used to uh, invest in like the public sphere. That money could be put to a social use through taxation. But that would minimize their power in the hierarchy, their position in the hierarchy. It would undermine their envision of their long-term project, which, like I said, is much more likely to think that the, the, uh, to be in the singularity than to be in space. But anyway, they have to do something with this money. And it, putting it into space, shooting it into space, is their privatized form of of destruction of accumulated capital, but in a way that does not benefit anybody else. He gets some residual uh, effect because he gets to influence things more. It's a propaganda victory. Like for all these guys, uh, they get to have their hand in the federal kitty in the form of NASA funding. Uh, they get to influence and control like our technological uh, agenda governmentally. That's all value, uh, but that's all second-order value to the main thing, which is the money's got to go somewhere. Shoot it up in the fucking space. At least then, hey, I get to go to space. It's just incredibly expensive recreational uh, wasting. Yes, as I said, the AI stuff is a hoax too, but I think these, it's a little harder to prove. It's easy, like I said, it is... Because it's less empirical than space, you know what I mean? We're like, we know what it is to go into space. What the singularity would look like, it is theoretical in a way that can give people uh, an in to kind of fill in the gaps for themselves. Put in the frog DNA in the holes in the, DN the dinosaur DNA so that you can fucking clone uh, a velociraptor. But I think if they have a long-term strategy for surviving eternally, which you would have to to make what they're doing worthwhile and not monstrous, like unless they're turning themselves into God, uh, they could not continue what they're doing. But, like I said, they're along for the ride, and they at this point are convincing themselves, as it happens, that they have to become God. And the main, and like when I say that we've lost the ability to control it, it's because the people who maybe hypothetically could control it, like actually intervene in it, because it's not totally cyber, it's not uh, completely, uh, it's not yet completely Skynet because humans still program the machines. For now, humans still program the machines. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to always be the case, and it looks like we're sliding away from that. But the majority of the important code is written by humans and the expression of human intent. And the people who could exert their intent in that position have been so alienated from humanity and from the, their very spirit by being that close to the heart of the thing, by being by so, by so uh, closely um, orbiting the black hole. that they cannot recognize the human stakes. They cannot rec They cannot hear the scream of the earth and of their fellow humans. It gets filtered into music because of how far away they are, because they've surrounded themselves in a world where they are convinced that they are the smartest people to have ever lived, that that means that they are the most worthy people of, uh, of their minds being preserved that have ever lived. Their, their lives being comfortable and pleasurable and themselves and them being able to do what they want 
is literally a, a in their minds been turned into a sacrament. That is a level of mental conditioning that cannot be undone. And they, and even if one of them had, even if they also collectively had a horrified realization of that they've it's it's too late. At that point, it is too late. It, it won't matter what they say. Like when fucking Elon Musk talks about he's afraid of uh, AI, uh, he is speaking from that part of him that re realizes what's happened to him and what was happening to the world as a result of people like him. And he is thinking of that moment when the algorithm totally takes over and there's no more human inputs. And he thinks, oh, I'm scared of that. But of course he thinks of it as a technical question. But it's a spiritual question. And it's and he is only ever going to recognize that it's it, it, what's happening until it has already happened. Because the only thing that he's going to feel is that lack of control. He'll never feel an ounce of, uh, of, of, of pain that is outside of himself. An ounce of the misery that's being inflicted around by him and by his world. And the world of the people around him. You will never get it. You will never feel it. You will only feel a lack of control. That's it. And at that point, once he has no more control to uh, to assert, doesn't matter what he thinks. They can't love at that point, and so they cannot. They cannot uh, hear the screams. The rest of us who can hear the screams are too far from the buttons. And the only thing that can overcome that is if we bring our voices into harmony, which is, of course, you know, the, the cheesy uh, fantasy, but it's the only one we have. And so we have to keep it in our minds at all times because you don't get to opt out of that. You don't get to opt out of having a... Uh, something you believe in and it's just a question of what it's going to be and if you say no thank you to that you're what you're saying is i'm just going to believe in my my physical senses and my my personal interpretation of those senses and that's what i'm going to believe in and that's a that's not any more real than than the fucking uh the 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 <clears throat> what's the word for it i don't like to even say the word revolution because it is so so uh, non-real, I guess just the transformation. I did like the last episode of Rick and Morty. You gotta love it. Look, he's you got Rick, you got Morty. I thought that this that, that that last one specifically was uh was I don't want to like do parables about Rick and Morty but all the clones killing one another trying to kill each other it uh yeah it wasn't bad they still got it as they say Uh, I really like the new I Think You Should Leave. I get that because it's like more of the same in a lot of ways that people are going to be less impressed with it because they, uh, they're they not having that like revelatory force they had when they first saw it because, hey, you know, this really was way different uh, than anything I'd really seen before. So it was never going to get the same result, response. But... Um, I laughed very hard at a lot of it, uh, so I'm very, I'm very glad, I'm very pleased with it. And as I said on Twitter, they managed in that uh, in the in the uh, cop movie parody trailer, they managed to have squibs. Every shot in that fucking trailer, that's not CGI, that's a, something going off in someone's shirt. 
which means that there is no excuse. And if I ever got lucky enough to be able to uh, make a movie, and it had it had sh gun sh gun shooting in it, man, I would really hope that I would put my fucking foot down on that and say, you can we'll fucking make money, or we'll make deals uh, on any other element. I'm willing to compromise on anything. But motherfucker, every goddamn bullet hit will be a percussive squib. Now, unless you're talking about like you have commando levels of violence, and then I'll be happy with, you know, three of the four guys who get shot just fall over like in a 50s western, but then there's a close-up on one guy who gets up and up with fucking squibs. That's fine, too. Just no CGI at all. Dan Flashes was very funny. Uh, the ice cream sketch with Odenkirk was very heartfelt. The Paul Walk Walter Hauser sketch, also very heartfelt. The Haunted House one kind of killed me. When he comes back and he's crying and he still says it, that was really good. Coffin, uh, Coffin Fails is very good. Oh, God, Total Recall Escalator scene. Mwah. God. That, that is just such a needlessly sadistic piece of filmmaking. That's, and that's really what sets Verhoeven apart, is that he has an, a keen edge where his excess is never just someone who doesn't know what the line is, which is sort of the Michael Bay thing, but who knows exactly where the line is and has intentionally gone one step over it. Like some poor civilian in that scene gets just absolutely murked by Michael Ironsides at the top of this escalator. And then he falls, and he's just a fucking schmuck. He's just a guy standing on an escalator. Turns around, annihilated. 50 squibs. Then he falls down, and then Arnold runs away. Michael Einstein and his guys run behind. And they cut to Ironsides and his dudes just stomping on this dead, bloody, shot-to-ribbons guy as they run for after Arnold. The definition of gratuitous. That's why he's one of the best ever. I'm very much looking forward to his uh, lesbian nun movie. That's going to be great. But yes, I liked where they, uh, I think you should leave too very much. I hope I hope there's another one. Bring them on. The Shark Tank one I thought really was funny too. Oh, I got the watermelon. Uh, LaCroix, I got to say, with the with the pretentious names, I guess that's why they can uh, charge like a little 50 cent or something premium over other seltzers. Is We don't have watermelon. We have pastique. Oh, God. The Tammy craps, too. Very good. Oh man, everyone's talking about the the bummer ass climate. Yeah, it's not great. Climate's not doing so good. Yeah, 
there's no question that the, the climate could be doing better. And this is where the whole, you know, capitalism as, as, as this satanic god overseeing the creation of hell on earth comes into things. Because it's getting to the point now where I got to believe that climate change denial is very, very rare on the ground other than, uh, you know, real partisans. I'd say you've got to figure 65, 70% of people are fully convinced that climate change is here and it's because of carbon. The, the two things you, that you need to have is like a minimum understanding of the world. But what, with that knowledge, can anyone do? What can you do? Because we lack the mechanisms of collective action to turn belief into anything. Because we have this democratic structure that has created a party rule that is as unassailable from the beliefs and opinions and best interests, both self and objectively understood, of its citizens, as the fucking late era Soviet Union did. 100%. There's no... There, any other claim is in my mind, uh, either disingenuous or, or delusional. Like, how can you look at what, what, what has happened specifically in the last 40 years to the average American, and you're going to tell me that, that their best interests are being expressed in their politics, like they're, even their, like I said, even their narrow understanding of self-interest, not even like a question of, you know, filtered not filtered through parties or stuff, but like what they think that would be good, what we all think would be our best interests. And then you look at what we have gotten, and this goes for basically everybody. Uh, it, it correlates about as well as you, would ex you had in the Soviet Union with its one-party state because the parties rule independent of real influence. Any influence is felt at the ballot box by 150 million individual voters who are making individual consumption choices not acting out of coordinated uh, interest they are they are voting for a brand that corresponds to a self-conception that is independent of any question of politics that is essentially aesthetic and if that's the case the party rules the parties rule in coordinating with each other and with the ruling class and with the international you know uh bourgeois and then ruling over all of it the goddamn tick the clitter clack of the algorithm they decide what to do and you could say well yes people didn't vote for this but this is all like in their general best interest only at such a remove from their like actual desires that you're not talking about a democratic deliberation that would take people's desires into account you're talking about a technocratic overlordship by people who are doing what they consider is in the best interest to a group that does not include them because they are in a bubble. They are not going to face the majority of the consequences, the negative consequences, the sacrifices that their decisions entail, like the 1970s, which we come back to again and again, the crisis of the 70s and how to answer it was made exclusively by people who would not really suffer and, of course, some of them might lose their jobs. Jimmy Carter might have not become a two-term president. But they would not have to work for a living. They would not have to feel uh, real precarity. They would not, most of them, lose even real power. And that means that what sacrifices they were willing to uh, accept were not being judged democratically, what we would want, but what they would want, what, off, what would offload the majority of the suffering to others. And, and because everybody involved in this, including the fucking media that reports on it, is within that bubble, they have no vocabulary to even express what's happening. Now, of course, a lot of these people in the long term ended up being fucked, like all those journalists... By now, oh, they're out of job. Well, for them in the short term, it kept them to get it kept until they got to a pension. 
And in the long term, who really gives a shit? And more importantly, even if I wanted to think long term, you can't because what? The algorithm. And if you're going to listen to the algorithm, you are going to sacrifice humans on a fucking altar, which is what they did. And choosing which humans was not done democratically. Yeah, like, look at the Republicans with their hatred of big tech. It's literally a consumer revolt. It's, I'm not being followed enough on Facebook. My grandkid won't reply to my fucking tweets. That's it. I am not being validated as a consumer, which is what we got instead of democracy. You will not be able to, if you look at what we got and what we sacrificed, what we got was consumer choices, and what we lost was everything else. But that made up for it. It's like the sugar made it up to the to the newly precarious elites of uh, of capitalist Europe and and the new uh, restive urban populations. Because we have uh, gotten all of our boredoms amused and all of all of our uh, material interests met, if we're above a certain level of precarity, we're going to be able to be. We can ensure that every day we're going to have food that we're going to be a heap of roof over our head. Above a certain level, I'm talking about. The people who are more likely to be, uh, you know, in some way democratically uh, connected to the system in that they vote and they participate in party politics. And even if they, ha even if they are more precarious, that precarity is not political. It's not understand as political, it's understand as natural. What's understood as political is that this order gives me access, even if I am precarious, poor, it gives me access to cons uh, creature comforts that we become uh, used to. And if you're at a certain level of that, if you're at a certain level of, of, uh, of, of material comfort, these options become stultifying. And the Goal and the uh, the job of becoming a consumer is not the job of satisfying your desires. It becomes a job of creating yourself, creating your sense of identity, uh, building a you. It, it it becomes abstracted to that level. Because how else are you supposed to pick? You're not picking by taste. You're not picking by. Uh, color, I mean, these things are all relatively insignificant distinctions. The only real distinctions that we can hold on to are much more shaded, are much more nuanced, are cultural. And that is where we get our kicks, being validated, being able to express ourselves and be seen by others in some respect, and therefore to see ourselves. And that means voting for a party that represents a basket of values that we then imagine to be ours. And that replaces politics, which means that on a question like what to do about climate change, which would resolve which would involve interfering with the algorithm, which would involve breaking the algorithm and ripping the algorithm out of, out of the heart of all of our uh, uh, political economic software. Like, we would have to delete this thing from our hard drives. That's the only way we're dealing with it. And you have on one side, you have the algorithm. On the other side, you have individual consumers who are just observing the world through a consumer lens Finding out, hey, uh, wow, the earth is cooking right now. Like, we are actually being cooked. Well, what can you do? You can express yourself, but you're going to be doing it through the framework of politics that baffles out through its many levels 
any real urgent material request because it cannot conform to the algorithm. You can vote for Democrats. What are they going to do? Well, what are they doing? What are they going to keep doing? It's why the hope is that the feedback loop that keeps people at this level of paralysis where they rep just almost instinctively hit the pellet of, of identity, hit the pellet of, uh, or hit the bar in, the, in, their, in their little Skinner box to get the pleasure release from, uh, from, a, from validating like themselves, that that paralysis will be broken because that, that taken for granted access goes away. And then that makes people have to reassess the world and how to deal with it. That's our hope. And that necessitates everybody to be in a state of awareness and readiness for the moment, which is coming and is happening right now all around us. And if when the, and enough people start turning away from the, the, the Narcissus River, uh, it'll do something. Doesn't mean it'll win because the forces are right against it are pretty overawing, but you know, to, to, it is, we're going to have to choose what to do with our lives. Every minute of them we do. And at some point, the things that have been good enough until that point, no longer suffice. Violence is inevitable. Well, I mean, hell, when is it not? Like we're in, we're in we are in a roiling sea of violence at every moment. I mean, you have actual you know uh, violence as it's understood in the bourgeois sense, but then you have the the invisible violence of the market wreaking havoc every moment of the day. And violence will continue. The question is, uh, who will be doing it and to what end? And will it be a pro it will, will it be a progressive force or will it be sort of the final guttering of the human candle? You can't know. That's the important thing. And any guess is going to be colored by desires that you aren't even aware of. Oh man, that movie, uh, The Tomorrow War, I watched that thing. And I mean, I, I've been thinking for a while about how uh, how weird it's going to be watching big budget movies made by well-intentioned liberals try to reckon with climate change. And already we have the, 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 the template from... Uh, Aquaman and, and Black Panther, where you have a villain who has a legitimate gripe against the system and undermine and, and underlines a actual like uh, contradiction at the heart of the global uh, order, uh, but who goes about stopping it the wrong way and for the wrong reasons. That's the important part. Like in Aquaman, Orm says, yeah, the humans are killing the ocean. We need to fight back. And the movie says, actually, he's just he's just jealous of his half brother Aquaman, who gets to go on land. It's like, I'm sorry, are we not killing the ocean? If there was a king of the ocean, wouldn't it be his fucking job to go to war with us? 
What other point of having a ruler would there be than to protect you from what we're doing to the ocean? We just cooked a billion fucking uh, fish. We cooked a billion sea creatures off the coast of British Columbia. Just cooked them. Fucking set a fire in the fucking uh, Mediter uh, Caribbean Ocean. No, no, he's only fighting Earth humans because he's mad at Aquaman. So that's one model. And we're going to see more and more of that. But then we have the Tomorrow War, which seems to very explicitly try to make a connection between global warming. And I guess it's trying to make that argument of, like, if we saw global warming as an external threat, the way that we imagine an alien invasion being, then would we be able to come together to use our ingenuity and our human uh, uh, energies to defeat it? But the movie comes down really on the idea that unless this is something we could shoot in the face, it's not getting fixed. And of course, you could argue, well, there are people you could shoot in the face to maybe change this, but you know, the very nature of uh, the system is that our fantasies of violence must always be cathartic and not addressed at our real uh, pain. That's the reason that the thing exists. That's the, that's the reason. It's, it's the same fun... Uh, the same power that keeps the global supply chain moving is the power that prevents violence when it accumulates with a system from naturally flowing up, but rather going down. And it's so great. So if you haven't seen it, this is a minor spoiler, but I mean, honestly, who cares? These, these 30 years in the future, there are these aliens feral creatures that have taken over the earth and have killed most humans but the humans who are left have created time travel and as a last ditch effort they've opened a bridge to earth 30 years previously to request humans to come and fight these aliens and they actually do a pretty ingenious job of uh, figuring out the time travel mechanism which is you've got the two portals you've got the portal between the two dates but you can't go anywhere else and it goes forward at the same pace both places like you know, a week that goes by on in 30 years ago is going by there. So you can't jump within it. And I think like, that's, that's elegant. And so then they just send people into the maw to fight these creatures. And then it's discovered. They discover that once again, spoiler alert, you can stop watching if you're worried about this dumb movie, but it really doesn't matter. It's not going to affect your enjoyment of it. They find out that, uh, these creatures were not aliens who landed in a ship in 30 years. They were underneath a, a glacier in Russia since the uh, 11th, the, since the 10th century AD. And that 30 years from now, 30 years from the initial moment when the alien, the human, the time travelers show up before the alien invasion, uh, 30 years, uh, they find out, th uh, sorry, in, 30 years ago in the thing, god damn it, talking about time travel is always confusing, uh, they realize this thing is actually in a, stuck underneath a glacier right now. But 30 years in the future, the glacier will have melted. And then all the right, the aliens will come out and eat everybody. And so instead, instead of preventing the fucking glacier from melting, they go to the glacier, find the aliens, and fucking kill them all. Shoot them in the face. And I don't know if they were trying to make that point or not, but it's pretty clear they're saying, yeah, there is no coordinated action shy of, like, violence organized by a social order, which means by capitalism, uh, to vent off uh, hostility and, and battle for resources away from the actual uh, structures of power. But the thing is, is okay, congratulations, you killed the aliens. You blew up the they're aliens. They're not going to come and, uh, when the thing melts. But you're still going to have a melted fucking glacier. And how many other glaciers are going to be melted? And what's that going to do to the fucking coasts? 
I mean, the fact that they go 30 years in the future and Miami is still there seems like they didn't really grasp the metaphor they were trying to use. They weren't really able to get through to the real implications of it. Like They drop into Miami of all cities, and it's all there, ground level. All the buildings are still intact, the ones that haven't been destroyed by the aliens. They do go to Miami. They fight the aliens in, in Miami. But Tenet is like that, too, a time travel movie about about the generational conflict that we kind of, that is going on without us knowing it, which is the generational conflict between us and the future people who are going to be born into a world that is uh, radically different than the one we can imagine. And uh, And those movies are both dealing with that. And it'll be fun watching just the mental, the mental uh, gymnastics being done with these big budget movies that attempt to be socially responsible and, and address issues without drawing the genuinely radical and terrifying, forget like politically radical, but just aesthetically unpleasant huh, uh, implications of them. Okay, folks. All right. I'm uh, going to head off. So next week at some point, I'll say when we'll, uh, we'll read Black Jacobins, or part of it anyway, and start talking about all the different ways that, uh, that our colonial agricultural economy uh, built the structures of uh, control resource distribution, political uh, management, uh, technological facility that, um, that allowed capitalism to sort of jump the barrier from Europe to the whole world in a way that was able to stabilize it long enough to defeat the global proletariat and then consume itself one way or the other. All right. Bye-bye.